I'm going to talk about common pediatric surgery emergencies. Obviously, there's a ton of them. So the uh, how I narrowed it down is I thought, what are the things that I, as a pediatric surgeon, would like a pediatrician to know um, when making a referral? Yeah. So what, um, and I think it all sort of um, a big area of uh, referrals is the groin. So I'm going to focus on that and then um, focus very tightly on what to refer, uh, when to refer. Yeah. So let's start. Um, hernias. So we all know what a hernia is, a protrusion um, of contents of a body cavity through a musculoneurotic sheath. So um, when we do the operations, uh, what we see is what you see on the left hand side. Yeah. So you can see um, that there is a hole there. Um, you can see that there's a hole there on the um, in the body wall. Yeah, so that's the internal view. So you can imagine when that hole is very, very small, there's fluid coming through. And then when that hole gets bigger, then the bowel starts to pop through that hole. And on this other side, um, in the B slide, you can see that there's no hole there. So really, it is as simple as that. So what happens when a hernia gets stuck is that the bowel goes through that hole, climbs in, and that ring that you can see there tightens around it. And so the first thing you get is the bowel can't go back. So the, the child gets tense, doesn't want to feed anymore. The stools may uh, reduce. And then you start to get the vascular compromise. So the blood can go in, but it can't drain as well. And then you start to develop a sick child if you leave it long enough. So um, the next question is, um, making the diagnosis. So um, you can all, you, you have all heard this in medical school, there's a lump, whether it is separate to testy, whether you can get above it, whether it is tender or not, whether it is reducible or not. And I think that um, approach is very useful when you're thinking about um, adults and that's where that's come from. In children, it's never as clear. And in neonates, it's even more difficult, yeah? So it, it can be very hard to feel a testicle separate to a hernia. It can be hard to tell whether the child is sore because they are, um, is, is crying because they are tender or because they're being handled and they're a baby, yeah? So um, the answer there is um, if the child is tender and if there's any obstructive symptoms that you can't explain, then the answer is refer, yeah? Um, no matter how unhappy the person on the other end of the phone is. Um, with hydrocils as well, I find it challenging with hydrocils because you can't always be sure um, that this is a tense hydrocil or a hernia. Yeah? So when in doubt, I think just refer. Um, which usually is in the history. So if you've got an older child with a lump that wasn't there, um, it could be a hernia, but usually it's a hydrocele um, and, and a reactive one of that, and they get better as it gets better. But with neonates, um, not worth taking the risk, just refer. So um, what we're thinking about as we receive the referral is what is the chance of this hernia being stuck and causing trouble? So with premature babies, it's pretty high. So about 30% of them will have an incarceration episode. And obviously the surgery for incarceration um, if you can't reduce it and get it back in and do the hernia operation, then you end up doing a bowel operation, you end up doing a laparotomy. So, um, and that, although that happens rarely, it's not unheard of. So with the premature ones, uh, refer early, they need to be on a list to have their hernia done before, before they go home. With term one, the incidence is a lot lower and the chances that they will incarcerate is also lower. So with those, we have time. With those, we tend to do at the next available elective opportunity. Yeah. So if they've got a reducible hernia, it's not causing any trouble, the next available opportunity. Um, now, with the older children who have, uh, sorry, incarcerated hernias in any size child, it's really important that when you refer, you give analgesia. Yeah. So when you've got your, your um, spiel for this is what I'm referring, we're very interested in, yes, how is the child? Are they stable? Have there been obstructive symptoms? Have you had to resuscitate them? Have we now moved from I, my bowel got stuck and it's obstructed to I now have a vascular emergency because I've got an area of my body that's ischemic? Yeah? So those are the things we're interested in. But I'm sure everybody will say to you, please give some analgesia. 
the reason for that is not that we don't believe that you can reduce the hernia, but because there's a good chance that if you cannot reduce the hernia, then the ambulance will reduce the hernia. So I think the reduction by her ambulance rate is about 70% of all incarcerated referral hernias, so definitely worth doing. Um, if, you, if the ambulance can um, reduce the hernia, then um, that really works out much better for the child because we can let them settle down, give it a couple of days, and then do a middle of the day operation and end up doing just the hernia as opposed to bowel repair surgery. Um, I'm just gonna pause and check with Selena. Um, can everybody still hear me? Any problems? I can hear you really well. I can't hear any problems in the chat box. So thank you. Good, good. Okay, fine. So um, just going back to the, the hernia referral, um, the, if you're making a middle of the night referral, chances are the person you're speaking to will be grumpy because we do work 24 hours and we're miserable kids anyway. So keep it brief. But the things that we're really, really interested in is what the anaesthetist is going to ask us. So the anaesthetist will want to know, is this a baby with a history of chronic lung disease? So if they are an ex caboose candidate or a premier who's had a hernia, that's a bit we really want to know. What is the HB? And if you can sense through an HB, that'd be fantastic because obviously they don't want to anesthetize if the HB is very low, they might want to delay for transfusion. Yeah. And then how much resuscitation has this baby needed? And are we 100% sure that this is not sepsis? It's not unheard of for a baby to present with an inflamed looking groin and it was just hydrocils because they sepsis elsewhere. So we've looked for sepsis, we've ruled it out. And then analgesic for transfer, we've talked about um, and we've talked about the timing for surgery. Um, any questions before I move away from hernias? So Adeline just wanted um, some clarification. She's asked, um, just around your comment about hydrocele's, when should you refer and when should you be worried? Mm. So um, that's a really good question and um, kind of gives away content in my next slide. Um, so I'll, I'll hold off answering that for a moment. Any other questions? Uh, yes, please. Have you ever come across a neonate with a ovarian herniation in the inguinal area? You have? Okay, because my daughter had one. And it's very unusual, I think, because I've spoken to someone who used to work at Great Ormond Street and they'd never come across one. Um, she had a very interesting presentation from going from she was premature um mm. she was a twin so she was quite small um mm. but she would go from sleeping in my arms absolutely silent like an angel to a high-pitched yeah. scream like you just chopped a finger off and even the great ormond street um consultant sort of said even though you're medical you have to prepare that you might be wrong but I instinctively stripped her off when she started this scream. So she she was doing it yeah. and one day she did it and I stripped her off and there was a lump there. And all I did was coil her up and breastfeed her. She never slept on her front. Uh, she never yeah. slept on her back because I think it she yeah. was tethered and she wouldn't she wouldn't go to sleep. I had to sleep her on her front. I had no choice. Um, but it it doesn't seem that there's many of those out there. And yet you've come across just a few or? Um, I'm not sure I can count. Um, so I can tell you for sure there's a male preponderance. So you're going to see hernias in boys nine times more often than you're going to see hernias in girls. When you see hernias in girls, it's going to be bowel. Very rarely it is a hernia, so but it's not it's not unheard of. Uh, those are interesting to talk about because what you feel is a little pee in the groin. Now, um, yeah. if any doctor has a pee in the groin, you think, oh, it's a little shotty lymph node, right? Yeah, um, and also you don't get the obstructive symptoms that you get with bowel. So a bowel hernia will quickly tell you, you know, the child's not feeding nicely. It may even go into obstruction. But an ovary hernia, the ovary will pop in and out, sometimes just pop out and stay out. But it's not going to give you any trouble until the vasculature is compromised. Right? So, so they are, they are um, more difficult to diagnose. Um, however, um, my practice would be to treat an irreducible 
yeah, so not incarcerated but irreducible ovarian hernia as one of the cases I would do urgently. So I would not send them home, I'd bring them into hospital and do the operation, pop it back in, know that it's safe. We simply don't know enough about um, what happens to an ovary when it's um, sitting in the groin with its vessels under stretch and I'm not willing to take that chance. Yeah, So it's not unheard yeah. of um, and right. the operation's the same. Um, yeah, because what they right. did say was she had a lot of inflammation and bruising on the fallopian tube. So the only potential sort of advice for the future was if she ever had problems with fertility to check for scarring uh, because of the, the way the fallopian tubes had sort of been inflamed as well. Yeah, um, worth keeping an eye on, but you know, back inside, which is good. So um, cannot comment much on uh, GOS practice. Um, it's been a long time since I worked there. Cannot comment on your daughter, unfortunately. <laughs> That's um, okay. Yeah. No, thank you for that. No problem. Um, if Selena, if there's no more questions, I'm going to move on. Thank you. Okay. okay. So. So is this an emergency? Does anybody want to take this? Mm, no. It looks like a hydrocele. Okay. Can you be sure it's not a hernia in a neonate? No. Because that's so what, what you just said. Might... <laughs> so what sort of things might you do to a certain? See if you can get above, go a little bit higher and see if you can feel anything there. Because if it's fluid, you should be able to potentially, you know, get to no space almost except for the vessels, yeah? Yep, yep. Examine the inguinal canal, see if you can find anything there, a bit higher yep. up. Yeah. That's me, that's me done. <laughs> that's pretty much it and the other thing is assess oh. for tenderness so a hydrocele will not be tender yeah um the other sign you sometimes see um is a, a blue discoloration so hydrocele will be the ones that have this weird blue tinge um and that that is just fluid in um uh, in uh, only seen in a caucasian really um so look for those things but if in doubt refer yeah um so when do we do anything about hydrocele? So we thought about the mechanism. It's basically fluid trickling through that little process of vaginalis and gradually it closes off. Yeah? And if you look at uh, boys at five years old, only 5% of those who started off with a hydrocele will still have one. Now, practice in regions is variable. Surgeons cannot agree when the optimum age of hydrocele um, surgery is. Um, so the kind of two numbers you hear is um, by three and by five, yeah? Um, so uh, my practice, that if we still have a hydrocele, I'd sort it out after the age of three because then I know I've given it the best chance, but I certainly know of other surgeons around the country who would do them only after five. Um, they tend not to cause any problems except when the child has a cough, cold, flu, and then they become bigger, yeah? But if there's a history of pain, then think about something else. Yeah, they should not be painful. Yeah, which is different to the parents thinking, oh, um, he's he's upset and he's sore about stuff, and then focusing on the groin area as a source of the problem because there's a clinical sign there. Equally, hydrocele should not be tender. So in most cases, you don't need to refer a hydrocele till they're three, and then refer them if there's any problems. Tenth hydrocele is a bit of a tricky one um, because um, uh, when when they're um, tense, there's a lump there, um, and then they um, uh, they can get some sort of dragging discomfort, particularly if they're big. So I think those are probably an exception that you can refer earlier and see whether the surgeon would be willing. Um, you know, if the testy and the vessels are like plastered um, over the tense hydrocele, then you you might want to um, put them on the list sooner. Okay, so that's hydrocele. Any questions about hydrocele before I move on? None in the chat box. Okay. Is this an emergency? Who wants to take this?
No. Okay, what what is this? What what do we think we're looking at here? It could be trauma. The mm -hmm. penis, the shaft of the penis, it looks very swollen. It looks kinked. I don't know what this little um, fold is on the side of the penis and the scrotum looks bruised, but sometimes yeah. scrotums do look dark. But definitely mm -hmm. the shaft of the penis looks very swollen. Yep. Okay. So yes, trauma is an option. In terms Anything of the, else on the on the feet? Something like um ischemia in terms of the darkening, you'd have to make sure that something's not becoming ischemic. Okay. Like a fine mosis. Yep. Any other take? Balanitis. A balanitis, yeah. Okay, so uh, the last person was correct. Um, so this is a balanoposthesis, so inflammation of the foreskin and the skin of the um, of the penis as well. Yeah. So now that you've nailed it, can you uh, tell us what you do about it? I've never been sure about this one. Some people treat with antibiotics. Some people say leave it alone. Um, some people say put steroid or topically, but I'm never really sure which one to do. It's very variable, people say to do. But maybe you can help uh, enlighten us. Okay, so this is an infection. Yeah, so um, basically the, um, the foreskin becomes infected because um, you get urine building up under non retractile foreskin. The urine dries up, forms salt crystals, things start to get inflamed, the bacteria get under. Um, through the mucosa, they cause an infection. The infection spreads from that red-tipped penis that you see um, and then spreads down the shaft of the skin. And if you take off the skin at this point, you would see that the head of the penis is also quite inflamed, yeah? So this is basically just a, like a spreading cellulitis that started with a foreskin. It's balanoposthesis, yeah? So the answer is antibiotics. <laughs> Um, these can be quite dramatic. You're basically a, a purple tulip bulb penis, that, and sometimes you'll see some pus dripping from that little hole. And they're very hard to examine because you can't see anything. Yeah. Um, so uh, what you do is um, test the urine, rule out an ascending infection into the bladder. So ask them to make a urine sample. Um, even if you find um, signs of cystitis or... It, <laughs> Um, I'm sorry, the urologist just come in as I'm giving this lecture, which is just pulling of the worst degree. Um, so give some antibiotics um, and then um, wait for them to get better. You want to see the foreskin again, because if there's any suggestion that it was non-retractile, um, what you don't know is whether that scarred foreskin will come away on its own or if there's any signs of BXO. Um, that scar the foreskin down. So give antibiotics. Coamoxiclav is where surgeons always start and finish. Um, it covers uh, gram-positive, gram-negative, gives you some anaerobic cover. So it will cover most UTIs, which are coliform. And then um, bring them back in a couple of weeks and check that things have settled and assess the foreskin at that point after the infection has settled. Um, the, this slide has something about shake and mop and propitial hygiene routines. Um, because the parents will say, well, how do I know that this won't happen again? So up until the foreskin comes off completely, they continue to be at risk of getting um, little episodes of balanitis if there's urine pulling up underneath the foreskin. So we say over and over again, you need to teach your boy to shake and mop. So do a wee, give it a shake, take a tissue, mop out that last bit of urine so it's utterly dry. And then... <coughs> Um, the foreskin can be gently retracted by the child, not by the parent, in the bath. Yeah, um, I'll come back to steroids because uh, those have their indications, but certainly not for um, balanitis and balanoposthesis. Any questions? There's just a couple of questions. So just wanted to, some clarification around the antibiotics. Um, do you mm. go topical, oral? When would you consider IV? So. Um, the way to think about it is it's a range of infection, isn't it? If you see a red-tipped penis and it's just a tip, 
Now it's worth giving some chlorpenicol to just to tip, yeah? Because what you're thinking is some stuff from your skin has gone under the skin into the inner preface and caused this red tipped appearance, yeah? But if you see a penis like the, the one in the side where all of it is now inflamed, it's starting to swell, then you want to broaden your spectrum. So I would give, um, you want to broaden your spectrum and you want to give it systemically because you have evidence that it is now spreading. So I would give an oral antibiotic at this point as long as my child is able to tolerate it and they're not having high temperatures or vomiting. Um, so that's, that's what I would do. What was the other question? Just when you would worry about giving IVs, um, or is there? So Coamoxiclav has the same um, tolerance orally as well as IV. Yeah. So the only question, uh, sorry, the same effectiveness absorbance orally as well as IV. So the only question is, is the child able to um, able to tolerate it? So if you've got a child who came in vomiting and looking sick, not feeding, there's no point giving them oral, is there? So it's the same. Um, thought mechanism that you'd use for any other infection. If I give them oral, will they keep it down? If they can't keep it down, then admit them, give them IV um, up until they're better again and they can have it oral. Um, with Chromoxiclab, you probably want to give a five to seven day course. Thank you. And just another question. Um, at what age would you expect to be able to fully retract the foreskin? I've got a slide for that. It's coming. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So we'll move on. Is this an emergency? Um, yes, it looks like it. It does look like an emergency, doesn't it? It looks really sore as well. It's like a mushroom. <laughs> Very topical. No, this is not a presidential member. <laughs> Oh, Manju Diraj says this is not an emergency. Manju, why? Tumbleweed. Can you chat to, on, to her on on the thing? Uh, it's paraphimosis, so an emergency. That's from another person. Uh, and Manju thinks it's a local infection. A local infection, okay. Um, uh, Luku, who thought it was paraphimosis, do you want to tell us a little bit more? Oh, sorry, I was muted. So it looks like it was pulled back and got a bit stuck and then swollen. So I just, I mean, I can't see it. I have it still very, very small, but it looks like paraphimosis. Yeah, so I totally agree. What are you going to do about it, doctor? Aha, I sent to urologist. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I mean, if... um put nothing and put them in a bus. Is this you your can't put you could put them in um, kind of warm water, use lubricants and so on, and very gently try and see if it's coming back. But if not, then it's better not to persist because you can make it much worse. Um, I've seen a case when they're required to use um, needles to re reduce the swelling and then kind of reduce it, which was very painful for me, actually, looking at it. Yeah, <laughs> to watch the needles going in. Yes, needles are a thing. Um, Adeline, you had a suggestion. Um, yes, I saw one where they put a high concentration dextrose on it until the surgeons could get there to uh, try to osmotically reduce the swelling. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Tal, Tal, you're right. So um, when we get referrals for paraphimosis, this is because um, the foreskin has been pulled back beyond the glands, yeah? And then if you don't pop it back over, apparently this is what happens, it gets stuck there. So it always is a marvel to me, like penile anatomy, who made this? Anyway, so um, you then you can see that ring of swelling, that's the inside of the foreskin. And what's happening is that the blood is still going in, yeah, because the arterioles are small, but the blood can't drain out. So it pulls up and it gets swollen. So this is actually a vascular emergency. Yeah, there's going to be a blood vessel 
muscle problem. If you leave this long enough, that pink tip of the glands that you can see will turn purple and black and can drop off. Yeah. The other thing that is stricturing quietly while we're watching this is the urethra. Yeah. Mm. So this is an emergency. So over the phone, we will tell you, get your 50% dextrose out, soak some gauze in it, put it on the penis. And the reason we do that is osmosis. So we're going to draw out the fluid. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't ask you to do needles. I'd do that myself. But yes, certainly um, if you're trying to get this done without a general anesthetic, you stick some needles in um, around. And what that does is open little windows to then when you apply the sugar, the sugar has a way in to draw the, the fluid out. Yeah. So before transfer, this patient should not leave your hospital without a penis that is absolutely soaked in dextrose. Any osmotic agent works. Salt works, but it's cruel. Um, so give them sugar. Um, if you don't have dextrose and you're in GP land, pop some sugar on it and then give them some analgesia as well because it's quite painful and it gets progressively more painful. And when they come to the other side, we're going to need to squeeze it. So if they've already been loaded up with um, some paracetamol, that really helps our cause. Yeah. And what we would do is squeeze it and wait. So apply pressure, try and get some of that edema back into the shaft of the penis, back into the body. Yeah. And then once you've squeezed it enough, you can often just pull the foreskin back. If you can't, then you have to slit it or cut it off. Yeah. And that's parafermosis. Any questions? Oh, what oh. do you put it on GP land? Sugar. So as an emergency, say you're at home and you come across this or you're in the community, you're not in a medical setting. Could you make up a sugar solution theoretically and apply that as an emergency? Yeah, yes. brilliant. Yes. Brilliant. That's Thanks. what 50% dextrose is. I, I always say, imagine you're in Australia, you'd still want to do something. Oh, sorry, the outback in Australia, not all of Australia, just the outback. <laughs> Any other questions about parafimosis before I move on? I think we're all good. Sorry, can I, ask, can I go back to pelinitis? Just one question I need to ask about pelinitis. Is that okay? Mm, please do. So uh, just about the urine dipstick to rule out UTI, I was just mm. wondering if there is pelinitis, won't the urine be positive? For Not always, Ms. Um, or if it's positive, it might be positive for a staff. Um, but it doesn't change what you do. Whatever you find in the urine, you want to know about it. So you're going to give some Cormoxiclav, but you'll also have a urine sample cooking. If the urine sample comes back and says it was coliform UTI, you know you've treated it. But if it comes back and says that it was Pseudomonas, then you'll want to test that again, isn't it? You, you, when they're better, when you've sorted out the balanitis, you'll want to sample the urine again. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Happy? Moving on? Yes, thank you. All right. Is this an emergency? <laughs> These are lovely photos, thank you. <laughs> this is my day-to-day -day bread and butter. <laughs> What are we looking at, people? Is that epistadiasis, which is infected? Okay, infection, she says. Any other takers? Is this a phimosis? Um, phimosis means that the foreskin doesn't come back. Hmm. That, uh, does anyone want to do just a description of what do you see? What do you see that is is not normal? Swelling under the um, foreskin, like ballooning, and a mottling of the skin, which suggests a uh, compromise in the blood supply. Okay. Any other thoughts? There's some scarring at the tip of the foreskin. Okay. Yeah. And it's a white ring, isn't it? It's a sort of grey, pearly ring. 
-hmm. So usually when you pull the foreskin back over the penis, yeah, even if it doesn't come back completely, the inside comes out and furls like a flower. That is what you expect. Now, there's no furling here. It's come back to, to reveal a tight gray ring, pearly white gray ring. Anybody want to nail this? Mm -hmm. mm. So this is BXO. Oh, glitterans. Okay. Yeah, this is Balanitis erotica glitterans. So this is a disease usually of the foreskin and it's a kind of lichen sclerosis. So it affects the foreskin, the, the, instead of having this nice moist pliable um, prepuce, it becomes uh, scarred and scarred from the ring um, outwards, yeah? yeah? And when you pull it back, this is the appearance you get. Um, so the reason why BXO is a problem is because it is progressive and it can advance. So here we see it on the foreskin, but it can also affect the glands. And you can start to see that the glands in the ring is starting to take on a gray, shiny appearance. It can progress even further and go down the urethra. So this needs treatment. It's not emergency, but it needs treatment. When BXO is really, really bad, it can cause them to become infected so the urine can't get out because the foreskin's closed off completely so they get a big ball of infected urine under there it can also cause retention if they stretch it down completely yeah but usually they come to you long before this has happened um, bxo in a 40 percent or so will improve with steroids yeah usually you have to operate so the steroids are temporizing so if they, you see them in um, your outpatients or your uh, GP practice, um, start them on beta methadone uh, 0.1, give them a six week course and refer them to a surgeon because they will need a circumcision. Any questions? What, what cause is it? Idiopathic. Oh God. Just don't know, nobody knows. And nobody knows why. Usually it's over the age of eight that we tend to see it. However, I have certainly seen a two-year-old come in with it um, and their reports of um, younger children, yeah. And once they start like having things like strictures and things, will they have to have repeated dilatation? How, how, what's kind of the outlook? Yes. Yes, all urologists everywhere will sigh when they hear um, the phrase urethral BXO. It is debilitating, it is chronic, it is long-term, and there are multiple treatments, most of which don't work. So you dilate them serially, you can inject uh, tropical, um, topical steroids, um, uh, various other things. It, it, TNF agents have been used to try and get rid of these strictures. Um, so when it's bad and it's in the urethra, it's a nightmare. Uh, but in most cases, it is limited to the foreskin and a circumcision is curative. Um, and what we do is once we circumcise them, we bring them back after a couple of weeks to check what the glands is looking like. And if there's any signs of glands, the XO, we hit it hard with steroids to make sure that we clear the glands before it goes down into the urethra. Okay, brilliant, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, I'm gonna move on. Um, so some of the problem with referring groin problems and penis problems is the language. So um, just no, having some definitions around it is important. So phimosis is just saying that the foreskin doesn't come back. It is physiological. So older children um, will have phimosis. It's not a problem. Yeah. When it becomes a problem is when it scars down, either because they've had recurrent trauma or recurrent infection, or because they have BXO. Yeah. And so pathological phimosis is what we're more than happy to see referrals for. When you see recurrent uh, balanitis causing scarring, you tend to see like a radial sunburst appearance of scars. And I've already shown you the scarred appearance of BXO. So any force that looks like that 
definitely needs referring because it is now pathological and we will um, certainly consider circumcision. Um, the foreskin, um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big sort of cultural thing, um, what the foreskin, um, wh when, whether you should hang on to your foreskin or not. I'm not going to get into that, um, but the foreskin does have a function. So um, it's important to say to parents that, you know, it's there for a reason. It protects the glands from um, the ammonia, um, from trauma, from... Um, and also, if you look at support groups for men who were circumcised when they were children, there's a lot of unhappy men who feel that they've had their foreskins taken off and they've lost um, the erogenous properties that would have been protected if the foreskin is there. Um, and there's some uh, hints that there may be an immunological role. Um, so not every foreskin needs to come off because it's had one infection. Um, the natural history of the foreskin, so there's a lovely paper by a chap called Osler that was written in, I think, 1960. They looked at a thousand Norwegian boys and they said, how many of these will have their foreskin and at what age? And what we found out is basically what is in this table. So at birth, all boys have an unretractile foreskin. It is normal. Yeah. By the time you get to three, it's about 10 percent. By the time you get to 16, it's down to 1%. Mm -hmm. So would I do a circumcision for a 16-year-old who's got a non-retractile foreskin? Yes, because at that point, if they're getting painful erections, yeah, if they're getting painful erections because it's tethered or because there's adhesions that are holding back, so every time they try and get an, they, they have an erection, it, it, it hurts, then yes, of course, we'll do something about that. But in most cases, the natural process of it ballooning during wee wees and the multiple um, the multiple erections that they have as they're growing older, and then the testosterone bursts that they get as they go from eight to twelve and enter puberty, um, all those things loosen it up. So ballooning is a good thing; it helps stretch it stretch it, stretch it out. Um, all they have to do is make sure that the urine is collected afterwards uh, with a shake and mop. Um, and then uh, just to summarize, phimosis needs time. If they're getting problems with, um, it's worth a trial of steroids because it can make it uh, more supple. Paraphimosis needs um, reduction, um, usually under sedation or a dorsal slit, and the exo needs a circumcision. Um, and the NHS is very strict about when we do circumcisions, we do circumcisions for pathology. So, um, I'll come back to perpetual steroid gymnastics because that's another talk altogether. Um, anybody who's anybody with questions at this point? All good. Okay, I'm trying to go back um, and making mistakes. Okay, so I'll move on. Is this an emergency? Um, it could be if it's associated with like um, mental adrenal hyperplasia, you want to monitor things like use and ease. Okay, so this is a child with ambiguous genitalia. It could be an emergency if um, it's salt wasting. It's a female with salt wasting. Yes, I totally agree. Any other reasons why it might be an emergency? I might be making a fool of myself, but things like can this can they have things like cloacas or anorectal malformations yeah. or things? Yep, yep, yep. There is a, a cloaca variant that presents like this. Yep. Okay, so the other reason why this is an emergency is um, for those of us who um, had um, have had children, what's the first what's this what's the first thing everybody asks you? Is it a boy or a girl? Exactly, exactly. So this is a this is a social emergency. Yeah. Um, the reason why I stress this is because um, we as doctors are very comfortable with grey areas. So we will say to people quite casually that you know, boy, girl is a spectrum, and there's a somewhere in between, and your child is somewhere in between. Um, however, if there's any chance that you can nail for this family what you think it is as soon as possible that would be good yeah so the reason i bring that up is because if they have testicles and you can see them and feel them it is a boy yeah um because uh, when I, I think there was a period probably when these things were overcalled or um they, they they were um called uh inappropriately sexed from the get-go 
I feel like through through my training years, which have been very many, um, it's moved the other way where there's a huge reluctance to say, well, actually, it's a boy with hyperspadius as opposed to um, uh, saying we'll just keep you waiting one week while we get the genetics. Yeah. So um, the, the same applies to both. If you can confidently say that um, they are gonads, they're palpable, external, they in scrotums, then it's a boy with hyperspadius. Okay, so we all know this, uh, genitalia are indifferent uh, between weeks 10 to 23 and gradually um, all the things that um, form differentiate and you end up with a, a female or male external genitalia. This is only the last final phase of what's happened on a genetic level and what's happened on a hormonal level. So this is the finishing touches and stuff can go wrong right at the end. Yeah. So um, this is what I find most useful for thinking about genitalia. So, you know, genuinely everybody's on a spectrum um, and you just have to decide what am I looking at? Is it a, a over virilized? over virilized male or, sorry, over virilized um, female phenotype or an under virilized male phenotype, yeah. Um, but the, the the leading question is, can I feel some gonads and where are they? If, they, if they're gonads and they look, they're in what looks like a scrotum, it will be a boy. Um, so hyperspadius is not an emergency. Please never call us in the middle of the night about hyperspadius. Public service announcements, over. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they can always pass you in, even if the erythral matus is very narrow. Um, I, I've, I've only ever once in 10 years um, seen a hypostatus that couldn't pass you in, but everything, um, they had urethral atresia. Um, they usually pass you in without a problem, and they will see them at six weeks and give them a diagnosis so that they can relax, and then we'll see them at a year and give them an operation if indicated. Um, and biggest genitalia is certainly an emergency. Um, as Selena has mentioned, if it's in complex with other things, it could be um, re related to other anorectal malformations. Um, however, it, it could also be an um, endocrine emergency, and mostly it's a social emergency. So um, get all your ducks in a row as quickly as possible for the sake of the family and convene your MDT. Um, so when to refer ambiguous genitalia at birth. There's some cases where um, we've heard about ambiguous genitalia before birth, but usually you need a happy coincidence of a sonographer who can see bits really well and a family that's chosen to have a prenatal carrier type, which doesn't happen often. Um, usually you find about these after birth. Um, Hyperspagias, um, when you do the baby check and you discover it, make the referral then. We'll see them and counsel them as soon as possible so that they know what they're dealing with. And then we plan the operation around um, a year or so is when we start thinking about doing the operation. Um, uh, I was gonna talk a little bit about terminology. Yeah, so with, with hyperspadius, it's actually really, 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 really easy. Um, and th there's like four sentences that cover it all. So when you make a referral, you talk about the position of the erythromatous. The erythromatous is in a glandular subcoronal penal, penoscrotal position, yeah? And then that tells you what kind of hyperspadius it is. You can talk about the position or what, what the foreskin is looking like. People get very confused about the foreskin, but basically all that's happening with the foreskin is it hasn't joined up in the middle on the front. Yeah? So it looks like this bag or this hood that's sitting over the foreskin. And often they have um, a bend of the shaft with it. Yeah, So it looks like a folded little finger like that. So, And then uh, it is important to mention the testes because if the testes are palpable, and palpable in a good position, then we know that it is a boy and we don't have to worry about whether this is a DST. Um, any questions? Any questions? Can't see any, nope. All right, I should move on. Okay, what's this? I think I may have given it away already. Mm. Mm. Anybody? From a smegma. Smegma, yeah, it's a little smegma cyst. And we all know what smegma is. Basically, it's your skin sloughing off because your foreskin 
protection is uh, not retractile, it can't get out. So all that cheese that we accuse teenage boys of having, that's basically what you're looking at. It accumulates under the foreskin, builds up, and um, and then um, um, is trapped. It will come out when the foreskin retracts. You might think I'm being facetious, including this in the slides, but I have received referrals usually at least once a year where the parents have been told that the child has some sort of penile tumor. Um, and so they show up really stressed and upset. Um, and then when we say it is not tumor, um, it is smegma, and we're not going to do anything about it, they're even more confused and upset. So smegma, the end. Um, you can't get it out. Um, saying to families to do special cleans and special retractions, please don't say that, just leave it alone. The foreskin will become more supple and more retractile as the child grows and it will come out. As it is under, it is sterile, it's not going to cause infection. Is this an emergency? Yes. Okay, who's that? E. Why is this an emergency? What do you think we're looking at? Yep, he says torsion. Do we agree with her? Yes. Okay, so neonatal torsion. You're doing a baby check. You, you think the neonate's got torsion. What are we gonna do? Call you. <laughs> okay, I guess it, th this one is on me. Um, so yes, neonatal torsion is incredibly controversial, um, but I, I think we can Oh, I think we've crashed. All right, let me see. I think so. Let me try and see if we can get back in. Uh, I think we might have frozen. Just give me a couple of minutes. Hmm. 